All right, Auto 2, so here we go. We're going to do kind of a lengthy discussion of gasoline fuel injection. In gasoline fuel injection, we're going to use a pressurized fuel to spray at the intake valve. And that pressurized fuel is hopefully going to be atomized into little tiny droplets to give us a correct air flow ratio for all of our operating conditions. That's the goal of fuel injection. So that nozzle twofold, spraying, breaking up the fuel into little droplets and letting it point at the back of the intake valve is our goal in gasoline, at least port fuel injection. So the advances of fuel injection over, um, I'm just going to kind of put them all up there and give the advantages over carburation. So we get improved atomization, meaning we're breaking the fuel onto smaller droplets. We get better fuel distribution with a centrally located carburetor or throttle body injector we didn't know for sure if we were going to get the same amount of fuel to each intake manifold rudder and consequently to each intake manifold, or sorry, each intake valve into the combustion chamber. We get a smoother idle because we've broken up the fuel better. We get improved fuel economy. We get lower pollution. And this is a big one. We get better cold weather drivability. In power is slightly increased, maybe. Yes, it's actually simpler. Carburetors are pretty complicated. If you think about trading this big old complicated piece of metal and all of its parts for, let's say, six fuel injectors, this is a lot simpler. Yes, we have a computer that's a lot more sophisticated or, or is sophisticated, and that's where there's complexity. But these basically are our advantages of fuel injection. So we can classify in fuel injections like this. So they're either direct or indirect. So either the injector is in the combustion chamber or it's pointing at the back of the uh, intake valve. Or if we're talking about throttle body, it's still pointing down at the throttle plates on the centrally located throttle body injection unit. It looks like a carburetor. Diesel injection is either direct or indirect. We usually think of it as direct, but when it's indirect, it's inside what they call a pre-combustion chamber, still exposed to combustion chamber pressures, so most people consider it direct, but there is a slight difference with diesel. So what you have here is, look at indirect gasoline injection here, where, and this is not 100% correct because that injector should be spraying at the intake valve. And then here's direct injection, where we've got an injector right in the combustion chamber. They're not showing the spark plug in the picture, but there's our basic difference here. This has been fuel injection on everything up until the mid-new millennium, around 2005 to 2008, etc. And then we started going to direct injection. This has, we found some problems with the system. So some cars um, are using a combination of both, actually. Let's keep going. So what you've got here is you've got a centrally located throttle body injector and an accurately pictured uh, indirect fuel injection. And I like this picture because it's, it does a good job of showing the throttle body injector spraying at the throttle plate. Well, right now it's at wide open throttle, but most of the time it's like this, part throttle. So the fuel's tending to hit the throttle plate and maybe uh, puddle to a certain degree, whereas this you'll get less of. Yes, you could get some puddling, if you will, down on the intake valve, but remember in both cases, when the engine speed is high, and this thing is spraying in milliseconds, you know, three milliseconds, five milliseconds, on, off, on, off, really fast, that you don't get a lot of that. But also this, when the air and fuel turn the corners in the intake manifold, the heavy stuff, the fuel tends to want to go straight. The air will turn the corner easier, and you get separation. Here, we just have air, so we don't have to worry about that. So you can see why this would give some improvements in over throttle body. This would give some improvements in um, emissions, a little bit better atomization, which is going to give you a better economy, etc. Let's keep going. So throttle by injection, just an overview. You've got a computer. You have some sensory input. This is a coolant temp sensor, RPM signal, MAP for load, O2 for feedback, and throttle position as well, giving in input. And then we're going to send a command for how long we're going to spray that centrally located injector. So a uh, um, it's just a little bit on throttle body injection. So fuel comes up, goes to the injector. It's also dumped back to the tank. We have too much pressure with a pressure regulator. Throttle by injection system, you don't need to write this down. Just notice it's got a housing, an injector, a regulator, some sort of idle speed control, and then 
On it, there's going to be a throttle position sensor and throttle plates. So um, I'm going to kind of skip through some of this and just, I would say, put your pen down for a moment because throttle body injection doesn't exist anymore. It hasn't been around for 20, 25 years. So just go ahead and just, we'll look at a couple things here. So I'm going to show some pictures. Okay. So this is the actual injector itself, and it's got this sort of ball valve. It's got fuel pressurized. When we, this, this blue is a wrapping of copper wire. When we energize that, it sucks the ball um, down, or in this case, it actually is going to suck it up, which lets fuel in. De-energize it, a spring is going to push it down and a seal uh, fuel off. So it's on, off, on, off really fast, depending on the needs of the engine. Let's keep going. And that's just saying what I just showed you. Okay, that's all that last slide said. So here's a throttle body system, and it's just showing fuel coming in. This is the injector that's getting pressurized, and we're dumping fuel off back to the tank through a pressure regulator. And something I haven't talked about, here's the throttle body. Here's the throttle plate that you control with your foot. Here's the idle air control motor, which is a little motor that, that moves this pintle in to cut air off and to back to let air in. So this is, so on these throttle body systems, we essentially close the plate very nearly at 100%, but not entirely so on every car. And we give air to the engine at idle through this guy, and we give fuel through this guy. Off idle, this thing does nothing. This is only to control idle speed. So now we talk about port fuel injection. And this is more important, and this is where you want to take some uh, more careful notes. So electronic fuel injection uses sensors, a computer, powertrain control module, and that's most commonly what we call it. Um, we used to have mechanical fuel injection, some older high performance, and then diesels were mechanical, or used to be. We can classify systems as electrical or mechanical. We can classify them in terms of how they spray. Bosch, uh, a German company, made a continuous spray. They called a CIS, or what they called their K-Jetronic. The injectors sprayed continuously, and they, they altered air-fuel ratio by increasing or decreasing fuel pressure. It worked OK. It worked pretty good. They got good gas mileage, but they didn't get that great amount of emissions. Then we can have time spray. So we can be electrical, mechanical, continuous, or timed. In time spray, we have three different types. Sequential, where we fire each injector in the firing order. So if it's a Chevy V8 5.7, it's 18436572. We fire the injectors corresponding to that. If it's group fire, all the injectors on one bank are going to be sprayed, like four here and four here. If it's batch fire, Injectors are sprayed, these two, these two, these two, these two. Now, if you're thinking about group fire and batch fire, you go, how can that be good? Well, remember that the intake valve's opening at 25 times a second at 3,000 RPM. So if we spray in groups or batch, it still works pretty good. You do get a slight improvement with sequential in emissions and maybe in fuel economy. Um, but standing next to these engines running, you can't tell. the. I've never been able to tell the difference uh, between them in terms of just smoothness of idle or anything like that. So that gives you kind of an overview of how we sort of classify our different port fuel injected systems. Let's keep going. So multi-port fuel injection, MPFI, which is where we're spraying at the back of the intake valve. We're talking about indirect injection for the most part, although most of these things would apply to direct injection. Pretty poor picture, but they're just showing you a computer. They're showing a bunch of sensors, coolant temp, O2, uh, I'm going to not talk about a thermo time switch, more in depth for another class. Injectors, throttle position, let's keep going. This is just another simpler picture. There's your tank. This one's showing a, uh, a frame-mounted inline fuel pump. You won't see this. this. These are going to be inside the tank. I'm going to go out to the car within, at the end of this presentation, and we'll show you a tank and some different things. An inline fuel filter, and we're charging these injectors and we have a vacuum uh, operated pressure relator to dump fuel back to the tank. So this would be pre-1999-2000. Here's a multi-port injector. It just has a needle with the red is fuel. The needle's in the center of the fuel. You can see the tip down there. This blue is actually copper wire like this. When I 
put current through that copper wire, principle of electromagnetism. It centers this plunger in the magnetic field. You can see it's slightly down right now. It lifts it, fuel sprays out, it de-energizes, and the spring pushes it down. So we're, this is what we call a solenoid. Anything that uses magnetism to move a plunger and do some kind of mechanical action, spraying fuel is a mechanical action, we call this a solenoid. We're using, usually, oftentimes we're using 12 volts. Some injectors we use, uh, when I say 12 volts, I should say charging system voltage, 14 volts. But some will drop the voltage down to like 5 volts. So we can divide fuel injection into these three broad categories, fuel delivery, air induction, computer controls. So we'll talk about them as we go. First, fuel delivery. So in fuel delivery, well, actually, here's an overview picture of the three. So fuel delivery, we've got a tank, a pump, pressure elevators, injectors. That's the green. That's fuel delivery. Our air induction, you know, is our throttle body, our air filter, and how we measure the air, et cetera. And then our sensory input to the computer. Computer's looking at all the sensory input and it's commanding what the uh, fuel supply is going to do. So let's talk about fuel delivery. So in a fuel delivery system, sorry, we've got a pump, a filter, a regulator, and injectors. And that should be pretty well fixed in your mind by now. We've talked about this quite a bit, and you'll see it in the picture. So here's the picture. And again, I'm going fast. If you need to hit 0.75 speed on YouTube, uh, on your YouTube video, or 0.5 speed, or hit the pause, do what you need to do. I'm going to keep barreling along and we'll get through this to try and make up for all the lost time we had this trimester. Here we go. So not the best picture in the world, but the green is supposed to be fuel. There's the tank, pump, filter, and again, remember these, these days are in the tank. Pressurizing these injectors, okay, and the red is dumping fuel back to the engine. So our electric fuel pump draws fuel out of the tank, pressurizes it. We're going to draw fuel out of the tank and pressurize it up to the fuel rail. This is the rail that feeds all those injectors. And then we're going to return fuel back to the tank, and that's what the red line is. So the fuel pressure regulator is in, in this. Let me just go right here. Oh, right there. So the fuel pressure regulator, if it has one, again, pre-new millennium, we're going to control pressure to the injectors. We're going to return excess fuel to the tank. We're going to use vacuum to vary the pressure on this fuel injection system with this vacuum controlled, that's just a diaphragm with a spring and a needle for about 12 PSI. So we can at idle, we can be about 30 PSI when vacuum is high and at wide open throttle about 42 PSI when vacuum is low. It just gives us a way of varying the fuel pressure a little bit based on um, engine vacuum, or where you could call it, you can, you can make that engine vacuum equivalent to throttle angle. When the throttle's closed, then vacuum's high, low fuel pressure. We don't need a lot of fuel. When the throttle's open, vacuum's lower, where you need more fuel pressure. Okay, this is just showing how uh, the yellow being vacuum is pulling on a diaphragm and affecting how much fuel is dumped back to the tank. So, um, and your injectors, this is kind of what I already showed you. They're a solenoid operated fuel valve. I showed you how that works based on current making magnetism and centering a plunger. So now we're on to air induction system. I'm going to slow down just a little bit here. So we looked at fuel supply. Now we're looking at air induction. And by the way, if you're thinking fuel supply, that was way simpler than a carburetor. Sure is. <laughs> it's why we all like it. Um, an air filter is going to trap dust and debris. So we're on air induction. We have a throttle valve that you're going to control with your foot. Modern cars, we actually we give us a, re a request to the computer, and the computer is going to open the throttle valve on really modern cars now. So there's a drive-by wire, um, meaning the there's no mechanical linkage or cable to the throttle plate. And then we have some sort of ducting or tubing to get the air to the intake manifold to the throttle body. And we usually have some way of measuring that air and the, uh, uh, both the volume and the temperature. So mass air flows measuring the volume of air going into the engine. Intake air temperature sensors measuring the temperature. Colder air has more oxygen, it's denser. Warmer air has less. So we're going to adjust the air-fuel ratio based on that. 
So this picture is pretty good because here's the air induction system. Air is coming in by some throttle plates through an intake manifold into the combustion chamber. What you're not seeing in here is the filter. And what you're not seeing in here is a mass airflow sensor and an intake air temperature sensor, which are usually included into one device. Um, okay, let's pause for just one sec. Okay, so what I did was I grabbed a couple of uh, mass airflow sensors. Down inside there, you can see a little wire way down the center, and that thing actually is going to measure the amount of air. And the way it does it is we heat that, that little wire up, and then airflow coming by cools it off. And we look at how much current it takes to adjust that. This is a really common modern mass airflow sensor. That little guy right there measures temperature. That's the intake air temperature piece of this, uh, I believe it's five wire mass airflow sensor. You can't see the element, but there's what down inside here, there's what looks like a little spring. And again, it's down the tube, so you can't see it. But it looks like a little spring. And that's the guy on this mass airflow sensor that is um, going to uh, measure the amount of air coming in. Let's continue. So third is the computer control system. So what you have is a centrally located computer. And over here, you have O2 sensor, coolant temp, throttle position, engine RPM from the ignition pickup and distributor when we had distributors. Uh, uh, over here, we have an airflow and a temperature sensor, mass airflow and a temp sensor, AC signal, a knock sensor, piezoelectric crystal to tell us if we have any detonation in the engine so the computer knows if we should have changed the timing, barometric pressure sensor. On more modern cars, we've got uh, vehicle speed sensor. We have um, computer, or sorry, we have um, shift um, gear selection, etc. Down here on the command side, it's controlling fuel injectors. It's controlling fuel pump. It's controlling ignition timing. It's giving us some way of self-test so we can talk to a scan tool. It's adjusting the idle speed. It's turning on and off the EGR. So this is the, on the computer system, we have the sensory in, input side, and we have the output or command side. So it says inputs and outputs. So a computer is usually in the engine compartment, sometimes inside the dash. Um, this one says commonly uh, mounted behind the instrument panel. That kind of was old school. They were in the dash more old school. They're under the hood more modern um, so we can get airflow around them and keep them cool, etc. Here's our engine sensors. So we're going to talk about them. Let me grab a few. So let's continue by looking at some different sensors that we have. And the first I'm going to grab. Oh. I didn't grab them. I'm walking over to grab them. Give me one sec. Don't hate me. Don't go to sleep on me. Don't push pause. I'm back. I'm back. Here I am. Okay. Sorry. Delusional. A couple of O2 sensors. Uh, this one is an O1 Toyota RAV4. had a P1155 bank tube sensor one. It had a heater circuit that was open. This is a pretty typical four-wire uh, zirconia O2 sensor that reads from approximately zero to approximately one volt. So this thing reacts when it gets above 600 degrees with oxygen and gives a voltage signal to the computer. Next we have, by the way, that's oxygen sensor or heated oxygen sensor, and everything's heated today. Next is the MAP sensor. So I'm going to grab a MAP sensor that I have right here. This is what they used to look like, fender-mounted Ford one with an intake manifold signal going to it. And this one, most sensors have a three-wire connector. So this was measuring intake manifold vacuum and giving some reading of load to the computer. Next is a throttle position sensor. And a throttle position sensor, as I'm grabbing a TPS right now, is a little variable, um, variable resistor. Um, we call it a potentiometer because it uh, varies voltage. So as the throttle turns in here, it gives a... Uh, output signal, a resistance signal to the computer, and you can see hopefully in there it's got three pins. That's a um, throttle position sensor. On this fuel injection throttle body, you can see this arm is moving that. So I open the throttle. If I can get it up there real close, you can see it's moving the arm, and inside there is a variable resistor. So it's telling the computer how far you open the throttle. And it's also telling it the rate of opening. Did you open it 
quick like a teenager or did you open it gradual like an old guy or something like that okay next is engine coolant temperature sensor so an engine coolant temperature sensor like this one off of Ford actually let me grab a different one here here's an engine coolant temperature sensor this one's not necessarily a Ford these are typically a two wire sensor you can see there's two pins in there we call this a thermistor it's a temperature sensitive resistor this guy heats up and moves a little variable resistor and the computer knows how hot the engine is and we know a cold engine needs a more fuel and a hot engine doesn't need as much fuel then we have some sort of airflow sensor um, and we have several different types but a mass airflow sensor I've already shown you an air vein sensor um, was one that had a basically a door that moved and changed a resistor I'm not going to spend time on it because they're really old at this point an intake air temperature sensor, I showed you that on the math that I already showed you. Crankshaft position sensor, okay, or what we call a CKP. So I'm grabbing one right here. Here's a crankshaft position sensor right here. A little magnetic pickup two-wire sensor that tells the computer, I don't know if you can see the, oh, I've got the pins broken off. I butchered this one for troubleshooting. Okay, so there's one with two pins in there, okay. And so what happens is as a metal prong comes by this, this little permanent magnet, there's a coil in there. When I interrupt the magnetism current, it flows to the coil in one direction. When this thing lines up, it stops flowing. When I go past, it flows in the opposite direction. So these guys will produce oh, a couple of one to two volts, approximately one to three volts of AC voltage. And the computer can tell the position of the engine. Here's another type here. The computer can tell the position of the engine and how fast the engine is spinning. All right, so an O2 sensor, a few notes on it. It's going to measure the exhaust content, and the uh, oxygen content in the exhaust. It's threaded into the exhaust manifold before the catalytic converter. And on 96 and newer, we've got one after the catalytic converter to monitor how efficient the catalytic converter is. Let me go back there for a second. So... We typically will have, we always have one in front of a cat and, off, and sometimes one behind. Uh, on modern cars, we'll have one on each, if it's a V engine, one in each bank. And then if we have dual exhaust, we'll have two catalytic converters and one after each cat. So it's very common to have uh, four O2 sensors. Not always, but sometimes. So it's, got, it's threaded into exhaust pipe. It's going to react with oxygen. If there's too much oxygen, the computer interprets this as lean. Too little oxygen, it interprets this as rich. And it varies from about 0 to 1 volt or 0.1 to 0.9 volts DC. Okay? So we say the exhaust is lean if the reading is 0.1 to 0.5 volts. We say the exhaust is rich if it's 0.5 volts to 0.9 volts. And we say around 0.5 is stoichiometric. That's our chemically correct or ideal, about 15 to 1 at, at uh, sea level. So this is putting out a... Um, a sine wave, you know, and it's going to go rich, lean, rich, lean, rich, lean, rich, lean, okay? And the scale is 0 to 1 volts, and dead center is 0.5. The air-fuel ratio is not able to be held right at 0.5, so the O2 sensor won't read 0.5. It's so reactive and so sensitive, it goes really, really fine adjustments, rich, lean, rich, lean, rich, lean, rich, lean, and the net effect is I get about a 0.5 stoichiometric air-fuel ratio all the time. There's just showing a picture of the uh, O2 sensor, okay? So we say that there's two modes of computer operation, but I want to pause here, and I want to come over to the screen, and um, I'll grab the camera in just a second. Let me get ready for you here. Give me one second. I should have paused the video so you're not bored and thinking I'm a loser, etc. Here we go. So we say that the... Um, O2 sensor is cross counting when it's going let me show you so if I put a scale here this right here is volts or voltage DC volts and this is time okay sorry I don't have this held very well there we go wait a second where are we there we are let's do it like this let's get over here okay so this is we'll put this mark here is zero volts and we'll put this mark here at one volt up there 
And what we'll do is we'll say the O2 sensor, and right in the middle is 0.5 volts. And when the car is running, the O2 voltage is going to look like this. It's going to put out a sine wave. And that sine wave is going to be what we're going to say the O2 sensor is cross-counting. It's going above and below this 0.5 volts. So when the reading is down here in the low voltage area, we can say that that's a, uh, a lean reading. And the computer says, okay, I'll spray more fuel. A couple of tenths of a second later, um, it's a high reading. And we say, oh, it's, it's rich. And um, the computer says, okay, I'll lean up the air fuel ratio. A moment later, hey, we're lean. Okay, I'll take away fuel. Okay. Sorry, we're lean. I need to add fuel. So a moment later, we're rich. So when an O2 sensor is putting out, and we can graph this on a oscilloscope or what we call our Vantage Pro, which is a snap-on oscilloscope, we can go ahead and see if the O2 sensor is working. It needs to switch from a peak here to here in less than, no more than two-tenths of a second. It needs to be definitely going like this above and below that midpoint or that 0.5 voltage and so if i get my act together at the end of this we'll graph a sensor so you can see it working so two modes of computer operation the first is open loop this is on a cold engine where we're not looking at the oxygen sensor uh, we're just we're commanding a rich mixture just based on coolant temp and throttle position and load the air fuel ratio is calculated using what we call coarse information, coolant temp, throttle position, RPM, MAP, or MAF. Okay? That's, I'm going back there for a second. That's open loop. That's how every car runs when they first start up. After a couple of minutes, they go into closed loop. Closed loop operation means that the engine's fully warmed up, and now we're going to use the O2 sensor as a fine air fuel adjustment feedback indicator. The engine has to be hot. The engine's uh, idling or cruising, the system, sorry, during, okay, this works during idling or cruising. The system will revert to open loop when we go wide open throttle. So we hit wide open throttle, we're going to look, sorry, we can't do anything about emissions. We just need to get this car accelerated so the kid can be a teenager, all right? So we allow for you to be a teenager. So the system cross counts above and below 5 volts, which is what I showed you over there on the board by showing the O2 sensor going like this above and below 5 volts, okay? So we want to get, um, ideally, from an emission standpoint, an economy standpoint, we want to get a car into closed loop immediately. We want that thermostat working good and that fuel, uh, cooling system clean. So it heats up immediately, gets warm, goes into closed loop. We're getting good gas mileage. We're not polluting the environment, et cetera. Okay? Um, just a little picture, nothing to write down here. Um, here's the computer during open loop. You get some pre-program instructions and sensing from throttle position, et cetera, and commands a rich result. But there's no feedback loop, and that's why they drew the dashed line. We're not getting feedback. When the engine heats up and the O2 sensor gets hot enough to start reacting with oxygen, now we've got some feedback to the computer, okay? So a MAP sensor senses engine load by measuring uh, pressure or vacuum inside the intake manifold, like I already showed you. High pressure, mean, uh, which is low vacuum, indicates high load. Low pressure, high vacuum, indicates low load. So again, this little guy is, we're kind of calculating load based on vacuum. It's not the best way to do it, and that's why we've stopped using um, MAP sensors and have gone to mass airflow sensors. So there's just a picture of an old GM uh, uh, throttle body injected. I can tell it's throttle body because I can see the regulator there. And the MAP sensor was located right along the, uh, the side of the air cleaner. Throttle position is going to sense the position. It's a variable resistor. It's going to, we call it a potentiometer. It's going to vary voltage. It's connected to the throttle plate. I just showed you this. So it's going to change resistance and therefore change the 5 volt reference that the computer sends back. And at idle, it'll produce, uh, you'll have about 0.5 volts going back to the computer. The computer says, oh, 0.5 volts, that means the throttle position is closed or very nearly closed. We're idling. As the throttle opens, the sensor resistance changes, signaling throttle position and rate of throttle opening. So that you open the throttle more and, actually, I should go like this. You open the throttle more and how fast you opened it, right? Were you an old guy like that or were you a teenager? Really quick, okay? Smoke the tires. All right. 
Next is a coolant temp sensor, ECT, to sense coolant temperature. At low temperature, sensor resistance is high, signaling, which is um, sensor voltage, at signal voltage is high, computer richness mixture, and uh, when we're warm, the, vol the uh, voltage is going to change based on resistance. There's two types of coolant temp sensors and uh, what we call thermistors. There's NTC and PTC, negative temperature coefficient, positive temperature coefficient, one of them. As temperature goes up, resistance goes up, and the other one as temperature goes up, resistance goes down. But two different ways of doing the same thing. So we're trying to use uh, temperature to give us some sort of voltage signal so the computer can interpret whether we're hot or cold and vary the air-fuel ratio based on that. An airflow sensor is going to measure the amount of air going in the engine. So that's a mass airflow sensor, which I already talked to you about. This one on this throttle body is actually mounted right here. This black box is our mass, flare, mass airflow sensor, and it's also an intake air temperature sensor, although there were some that were separate from that. On a mass airflow sensor, incoming air cools a hot wire, um, and the computer will interpret the current that it, he, it takes to keep it at a constant 78 degrees Celsius. I believe that's the measurement for General Motors anyways. It'll measure the current flow and interpret that as so much air coming in, and therefore it knows your load against the vehicle. An air vein style had a flapper door to operate a variable resistor. And I'll grab one of these um, while you're jotting it down. So uh, Mercedes used these, and other people used these. And I'm looking for my air vein sensor. Where did I set it down? Mr. L, get your act together. Give me one more moment. Here it is, right in front of me. Wow. Really, Al? Really? Okay. So here you go. Here's an air vein sensor like this. And so air would come in like this, push that door open on the back side. That door is going on a variable resistor. You can see changing. So the electronics would interpret the change in resistance as amount of airflow coming in. So this is what was used on um, lots of German cars, lots of um, Asian cars, etc. So this is just showing that air vein door changing resistance. I'm not going to spend any time with it because it's pretty old. Intake air temperature sensor would just give us a temperature of the incoming air because air temperature affects air density. Colder air is more dense, has more oxygen, it requires more fuel. Um, it operates real similar to a coolant temp sensor. Crankshaft position sensor detects engine speed and position. Uh, the information is used by a computer for ignition timing and fuel injection operation when we're going to spray the injectors, although a lot of times we use uh, camshaft position sensors for injection timing, but almost always the crankshaft position is used for ignition timing, turning on and off the, the or, or sorry, triggering the ignition module or transistor base, and then that switching device turns on and off the coil primary current to make a spark. Injector pulse width, and we're just about done. Injector pulse width is the on time of the injector, and so how long are we going to spray the injector for? And the computer is going to determine this based on all the sensory input we've just been talking about. As the throttle opens, the computer lengthens the injector pulse width to richen the mixture. And then at low load, the computer shortens the pulse width. Okay. Get that back up there. So it's just showing these little red lines are showing the on, off. Actually, in this case, it would be, it'd be on, off, on, off, on, off. And here it's on, off, on, off, on, off, you know, and we're, the width of the on, off is changing the time, okay? All right, so they're showing this. is actually kind of actually drawn backwards, but they're showing the short pulse on, the on time here and the on time here, but typically in injector, what happens is the upper line is charging system voltage. When you turn the injector on, it drops to, the voltage drops to zero because the injector's on, but they drew it like they did. We don't hate them. Let's keep going. That's it. All right. So let me pause this, and we'll show you a couple of things. In the All right, Auto 2, here we are outside on a 2004 Tundra. 
you can see I've got just the cab and some mass and you can see the frame but what I wanted to show you is the fuel tank here so you can see the fuel tank and here's the fuel filler nook here and there's the fuel cap and there's some anti spillback stuff and some venting stuff and um, this is allowing us to get fuel down into the tank here and you can see the tank runs from over here and goes underneath there so it's a pretty good size one there's the cover there that round cover with these little bolts here and what you're looking at in there where i'm pointing is you're looking at a plastic fuel line coming in and you're looking at electronics coming in for this guy right here to operate the pump this guy right here for a pressure sensor for evap testing so hopefully you can see that um and you've got a number of lines over here here's your charcoal canister for your evap system and there's some electrical controls and some vents and so on you can see that this hose right here this plastic hose is bringing fuel vapors up from the injection unit way up on the front of the engine so we have some venting to that canister you can see this hose right here is some venting to that canister so this fuel tank has you know a fuel filler neck and it's got baffles inside it's got an electric pump inside it's got a fuel line there and it's got you see it has two lines so this one is a return type system it has one fuel line going out to the engine one coming back we got a pressure sensor for testing and we have all of our evap evap controls there as well so we'll pause and show you another thing here in just a moment so here we go auto two with the got an o1 uh subaru out back up on the rack here now we're going to look at the fuel tank and see what we got here so back here is um looks like our fuel tank is right here you can see a strap here okay and you can see the other half of the tank here and you can see a strap here so this thing actually goes over the drive shaft one of the things you can see is you can up here you can see the looks like the fuel filler neck which is coming from way over here in the fender there's a pipe there hopefully you can see that and goes in over here and i don't think it's too dark to see that where i'm pointing with my finger um but you can see all of these lines here all of these lines here are fuel lines or vapor lines and there's the charcoal canister right there for our fuel evaporation emission control device so a lot of lines, a charcoal canister, a tank here. And then when we come over here on the side, I'm going to look for fuel lines. Now, I can't see the fuel line going forward on this car. In most cars, you can. On this one, you can't. But here we are at the back. And it's obviously a dirty car, obviously a rusty car. But there's our fuel tank and our emissions canister. All right, Auto 2, I've got the 2008 Ford Edge running. And I've got the Vantage Pro and I'm graphing the output of the O2 sensor so you can see the cross counting. So let's go take a look at it. It'll be a little noisy. I'll do my best to talk over the sound of the engine. So there it is out there. If I turn my screen around so I can see what I'm doing. And so on the screen, you should be able to see that. Oh, yeah, you can see it easily. So what you're looking at is over here on the right we got a zero to one volt i'm going to change the screen here we go uh to here let me change the voltage to one volt there i did let me get out of there and out of there and go to there and go to there and there we go so now what you're looking at on the screen is you're looking at the voltage from zero up to one volt there. So it's cross counting nicely with 0.5 in the middle. And it's changing in approximately, it's, it's going to get going faster as it heats up. So it's going up and down in approximately one second right now, which isn't fast enough. You can see I've connected. Here's the oxygen sensor down there. 
thread it into the exhaust manifold, and I put a little pin in there and back curved it. <coughs> and you can see it reading there. And as the engine warms up, it's going to go faster and faster. So that's what we meant by cross-counting and using the Vance Pro to be able to see that. All right, that's it for now. Talk to you guys later.